just for the record, you are not a climate change denier. No. Correct? No, climate change is real. The and surface, global warming is real? The surface temperature of the planet's a little bit less than a degree Celsius warmer than it was 100 years ago, and people have something to do with it. They don't have ever, everything to do with it. There are two warmings of the 20th century, one uh, from about 1910 to 1940. It's about the same magnitude as the second warming that occurred from about 1975 through 1998 or so. The first warming could not have been caused by carbon dioxide. There are characteristics of the second warming that indicate that it has a carbon dioxide component. Carbon dioxide doesn't explain everything in it, but it's certainly there. So your point, though, is that uh, cl global warming, as is commonly known, conventionally known, and is told to so many people, is exaggerated. It, that's right. And, and the, the thesis of my book, Climate Coup, mm -hmm. is that this is a natural outgrowth of the way that we have federalized the scientific process. In other words, uh, once the problem, scientific problem enters into the political realm, then massive funding is released, and it's guaranteed to stay a problem forever, and probably to get worse, to be perceived as worse and worse and worse. And in, in my presentation tonight, I did quantitative analyses demonstrating these biases that exist. So there's a perverse incentive to have the worst case scenario. Oh, uh, there's there is a natural economic pressure. Remember, the global warming is competing with other issues for scientific tax dollars. Mm -hmm. It's competing with AIDS, it's competing with cancer. You never ever get large programmatic funding by going in front of Congress and saying, well, my issue really isn't that important. No, you get programmatic funding by saying, look, I'm sorry to inform you of this, but if you don't give us this funding, your children are going to grow up to be midgets. So there's, um, uh, it's not really science then is what you're saying. It's not really the scientific method. That no, what's happening, is, what's happening is that we are putting biases in science, which ultimately will work themselves out, uh, usually to the embarrassment of many people. Uh, you, do, you do have to remember that, that uh, acid rain was going to be the end of the world. Our own Nas National, Re National Research Council said it would create, quote, an ecological silent spring. It didn't do that. Ozone depletion was going to be the end of it all. Uh, it's interesting that you would see back in the acid rain days and the ozone depletion days, when those were the rages, that they were all explanatory. All of a sudden, Acid rain explained the death of the dinosaurs. Then ozone depletion caused by some volcanic thing explained the death of the dinosaurs. Guess what explains it now? I think global warming or something like that. So even if one believes that global warming is, is, a, is a pressing issue that needs to be uh, uh, attacked, you pointed out tonight that even if the United States adopted uh, the cap-and-trade policy of Waxman-Markey, that there wouldn't be much of a difference, no. and that if the world adopted, or at least the industrialized countries adopted wax, Waxman-Markey, it wouldn't make that much sense. No, if, you if, talk all, a about if all the nations of the world that had obligations under the Kyoto Protocol, that's the United States, Canada, Europe, the industrialized world, not India, not China, uh, uh, did this, the amount of warming that would be prevented would be about eight hundredths of a degree Celsius per 50 years. That's an amount that's really too small to measure, given our measurement technology. But the cost would be enormous. And you said something provocative. You said that you think the best thing to do is nothing. Because nothing is something. Doing nothing means you're not taking money from people in futile attempts to stop warming. And the global warming legislation proposed that the monies that were taken for the purchase of carbon emissions permits would then be used by the government to foster certain technologies. Very dangerous. Why don't you just let the people do that? Mm -hmm. And they will invest in, generally, companies that produce things efficiently or produce efficient things compared to their competitors. And it, it's always instructive over the course of the last, oh, 20 or 30 years or so, to take a look at the share prices of Ford and General Motors 
the latter of which went bankrupt, uh, and Chrysler versus, say, Toyota and Honda. And, you know, the, the, the problem that was perceived with the American automakers was they were producing cars that weren't particularly reliable and were not particularly efficient, while Toyota and Honda developed this reputation. Well, people who invested in the latter were loaning money to the companies that began to produce increasingly efficient cars more rapidly. People that de-invested in the former were not giving money to companies to fritter away on vehicles that were very efficient or inefficiently produced. So if you give people, you let them have their money, God, what have we come to in this country when we're saying, if you let people have their money? Uh, they, it's not going to sit in their wallet or be buried in a hole in the ground. It's going to be invested. And that hastens the technological development of the future. You're kind of a voice in the wilderness, though. I mean, there are, are most client, climate scientists um, agreeing with what you're saying or disagreeing? I think that they're, the public perception and the public persona of climate science has to be that this issue is so important that it's near the end of the world. Because if it's not, everybody's really embarrassed. And frankly, the gravy train grinds to a halt very quickly. And worst of all, you have to go back to the coach section of the airplane. That's personal. I did some research on you, and I saw a, a figure that your critics throw out saying that 40% of some of your funding comes from people who produce fossil fuels. Is there any truth to that? That, that was a statement made uh, on a television program last August or something like that. Um, I think that that was a reasonable number mm -hmm. at the time. But remember that, that I'm a self-employed scientist. I run a company. I contract with people who I propose research for. And where am I going to go? The government? Now remember that when I write something up for publication, it's subject to the probably a more vigorous peer review because people frankly don't like people going around saying public choice is influencing you. So I think it actually results in more diverse science and it's probably a better thing. Frankly, rather than having a monopoly research provider, which is the federal government for all intents and purposes. All right. Patrick Michaels, thank you very much. Sure.